Hello, I'm Lars, uh, and this is joint work with colleagues in Linköping. Uh, this is my overview. I will start with a, a small problem and then tell you what methods and resources we used to uh, approach it, and then something about results. Um, the third author of the paper is actually a design researcher, and he came to us in the sort of Sweet Clarion node in Linköping with uh, a problem. And he has already told us he had the impression that increasingly from the perspectives of the Swedish government, the concepts of architecture and design were sort of uh, brought together or converging or, or put under the same umbrella. And he thought this was detrimental to his field of design because it tended to sort of trend towards architecture. And he asked us, could we uh, find textual evidence that would support this impression? And primarily, he was interested in an official a government report produced in 2015, which I will come back to later. Um, he asked us many questions, but in this study, we focus on, on the following four terms. Uh, so there you can say there are two concepts, architecture and design, but there are for the concept of design three terms, design, form, and uh, form giving. And if you know English, you probably understand the terms, uh, whereas the fourth then is sort of uh, mirrored on the German form gable, which I think have the same meaning. Uh, the word form is a bit special. Uh, you will see it has a, a very high frequency, but it's due to the fact that it's many meanings in sort of in the standard language. Now, the first uh, source you go to are the dictionaries, perhaps, and then you can see that architecture is defined sometimes as an art, sometimes as in science. And uh, interestingly enough, sometimes in terms of design, whereas design is not defined in, in the other way. Uh, they have differences. Architecture relate primarily to buildings designed to, say, everyday objects, but they are both uh, somehow related to art. So um, among the resources or the texts we received from, from Stefan, the design professor, uh, was this... Uh, official report from 2015. Now, in this work, we primarily compared that to an earlier official report produced in 1999. There are some differences in content. I mean, the latter is on architecture and design. The first is primarily on design. And he also gave us an, a, a lot of other texts. Uh, we also wanted to, so we wanted to see what happens in, in these years, and we also wanted to compare whether you could find similar or different trends in general language. So turning to the resources or the methods, you can say we have sort of a standard toolbox doing word embeddings, doing topic modeling, doing sentiment analysis. Uh, using sort of general tools. Uh, but from Sweet Clarin, we needed, uh, as we all often do then, uh, the parsing pipeline, which is called SPAR, uh, which has the advantage that it gives us lemmas and it also gives us word senses. And for sentiment analysis, uh, we have a dictionary called Sensaldo which sort of uh, give sentiment attributes to word senses. And then there was this sort of general language corpus called this cultural mix gigabyte corpus, um, which is quite large, 1 billion words uh, from different text types and from different time periods. And in this work, we selected then material, especially news from the 1990s, and for the most recent period, 2010 and, and forward. Uh, this is data from the general corpus. 
And here I just wanted to show that uh, the more recent corpus is bigger, uh, but there are different trends for the terms of design, uh, the design of forum evening. Uh, design becoming more common in spite of the fact, or perhaps because of the fact that it was introduced into the language much more recently. Uh, but in the 90s, the proportions was sort of five to one for design for form evening and later 13 to one. Um, so now to, to some of the, to the results. So I said, we have basically uh, three models of, of context for these words. And the first is word embeddings. And here from the general corpus, and what you can see here is that the, the, uh, the, the sort of assumption that the two words design and form evening means the same are synonyms is sort of shown by the word embeddings. They are nearest neighbors in almost all of the, or in all of the uh, word embeddings that we produced. What we also can see is that uh, design is sort of approaching architecture in the word space. There's a difference between 1990s and, and uh, 2010s. Um, so, so it's coming near. It's not the nearest, but, but it's it's yeah, it's coming near. Now we turn to the reports, uh, and here we try to do topic modeling. Uh, there are only two reports, but we split them into chapters according to their chapters and perform uh, topic modeling. And what we can see here is that uh, in the earlier report, of course, design would be more common. It appears in more topics and the word architecture is only found in two of these topics. And then we're looking at sort of the, the 10 most common words for each topic. In the later report, on the other hand, they always appear together. So out of the 14 topics, um, they are among the top 10 in eight of them, and they will always appear together and never on their own. Uh, here are some frequency data, and that just basically shows that, that there is a difference in, in themes of the two uh, reports. But in the, in the later, the, the frequencies are quite equal apart from form evening. Now, we also did concordancing, and then we discovered something which we thought was interesting, namely that, as in the title of the report, the three terms, uh, architecture, form, and design, or architecture, form, evening, and design, appear coordinated uh, a large part of the corpus. And actually in more than 50% of the instances of these words were as part of, of, of the coordination. And we refer to that as the, the triad. So in, in the report from 2015, there were 170 instances of, of this triad. And we can see also that in earlier um, documents from the government, uh, you can find them in the form then architect to form evening and design, but not to the same extent. Now, before, so what we decided to do then, because before that we had done sentiment analysis of, of the two reports, I will come back to that. Uh, but we decided because of the sort of high frequency of this triad to re-tokenize the corpus. And again, you can see that about more than 50% of the instances belong to the triad. And this diagram basically shows that, shows the same thing. You have the retokenized corpus to the right. And so uh, you can see there's a lot of occurrences of the triad. Now to the sentiment analysis, uh, as I said, we had done it on, on, two, on the two versions of the, of, of the 2015 of the report, and we have compared it with the earlier report. But overall, both reports have a neutral tone. It is somewhat more positive 
in the more recent report, and that is significant. Now, looking at the terms, uh, we compared sort of the sentences um, from the two time periods, and we found that the terms form and design had a more positive tone in the more recent uh, report. However, uh, doing sentiment analysis on the retokenized report, we find that that sort of significant difference could all be attributed to the triad. So it was sort of the triad that carried the positive context. Whereas if you looked at the terms outside of the, ter outside of the triad, there was no significant difference to the earlier report. So back to the original question. Uh, could we find indications of sort of a, a convergence or a more a kind of integration? So we think we could, and that the sentiment analysis gave us the, the sort of um, hardest evidence for this, although we could see it also in the topic analysis. And as I said before, the term design is taking over from form evening generally. So we can say there is some textual support for the impression that architecture and design are placed under the same umbrella. Um, now, whether that is detrimental to design, we, we, that's up to sort of our design professors. Um, about using sweet clarion resources, we couldn't have done the sentiment analysis we did without uh, the SPAR parser and the Sensaldo uh, dictionary. Uh, so they were sort of essential to do the work we did. But we also think that, I know Bente talked uh, the other day about the, the knowledge infrastructure of, of Clarin and we couldn't, we, we believe we couldn't have done this without or sort of giving, giving some links to the design professor and let him work it out himself. The sort of the knowledge we have in the, in the Swiklai node is essential for doing this work and doing things like uh, retokenizing, for instance. Now, finally, uh, sort of, a lot of the work here was sort of distant reading, right? But we also looked at the data uh, in, and in fact, in the general corpus. And there we found an interesting quote, which I give to you as a final reflection. Uh, it was a quote from the Danish poet, and I also believe architecture and designer Piet Hein who has apparently have said that if a product is 50 meters long, we call it architecture. If it is bigger, we call it urban planning. And if it is smaller, we call it design. Thank you. Okay, so um, are there any questions? Thank you. Uh, very interesting and also useful for me. So, um, which one of the experiments did the, the did your professor in, in uh, design find most useful? If if you could just choose like one or two of them. <laughs> um, I don't know. I I, I know that the the, the sort of uh, experiment he found least useful was word clouds, and I I didn't include that. <laughs> So um, I, I, I think if, if I am to guess, I would say the, the sentiment analysis. I, I don't think he has looked closer at the topic, the sort of the topic analysis, although we have showed them to him. So your recommendation would be avoid word clouds and use sentiment analysis. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, 
Thank you very much. Uh, very uh, nice combination of several methods. Uh, I would like to ask about the topic modeling. I wouldn't underestimate this, but uh, but um, have you tried to, because topic modeling is always uh, initiated randomly, so topics can be different. Have you tried to compensate this effect? Are you uh, doing several rounds, for example, or iterations? Um, I mean, yes, we have. We have generated several topic models. So to sort of to get, to get some uh, perspective on the randomness, and and they of course they come out differently, but they have the same general trend of, of this sort of uh, design coming closer to uh, architecture. Thank you. Very interesting. Uh, another question. Uh, hi have one question that um, could you go back to the slide where you had uh, form uh, and bottom meaning and uh, we can just try it uh, and which one uh, no you had the frequencies of them so you need to go back for the even oh they were on the same line you had some <laughs> no There. Yeah, okay. Um, would it be that in Swedish, the word design, it used to be more affiliated or similar to form, and then now it's become more uh, similar to formgivning. And uh, in the triad, it uh, therefore uh, switched in order not to have three exactly similar mm -hmm. words. Yeah, but I, I would, I have to guess again that I think just that the, if you put form union there, every word is very long. And so you get a better rhythm if you just put form there. Architecture form design. Yeah. Okay. Uh, if there are no further questions, we we'll thank the speaker and move on to the next question. Well, hi everyone, can you hear me? Good. Ah, okay, now do you hear me better? Ah, great. Uh, it's in the two clues. Okay, good. Um, so I will present work that I conducted together with Robin Schaeffer at the University of Potsdam. Uh, and I conducted this work while working at Espesam at the Institute for Language and Folklore and at the Center for Digital Humanities at the Uppsala University. And Espesam is short for uh, the National Language Bank Society, which is a part of the Swedish National Language Bank. Uh, so the background is that I received a very small funding for, for doing a collaboration project with the University of Potsdam. Uh, and what, we, what I received money for was to uh, use some of the tools that we have developed at SPSAM uh, on the corpora on climate change that they have collected at Potsdam University. So there are three organizations uh, involved, and I'll just present them very shortly. Uh, so it's SPSAM Society, which is um, at the Institute for Language and Folklore. Uh, and we are a clarion knowledge center for the languages of Sweden. So we work a lot on on producing resources for the minority languages of Sweden and also for Swedish. But we also uh, make some tools as well. And then it's the Applied Computer Linguistics Discourse Lab at the Potsdam University. And they have a project uh, right now, uh, which they call Probing the Discourses of Climate Change. What can automatic text mining reveal about climate change communication? Uh, and one, one thing that they do in this project is to collect and annotate corpora. So we wanted to do something together on these corpora. Uh, and then during this project, I, I changed jobs. So I, I'm, now, I'm now working at the Center for Digital Humanities at Uppsala. So I've continued the work there a bit. 
Uh, and what we are doing is that we we are we perform technical support to to the researchers within uh, within the humanities and the social sciences sciences at Uppsala University. So uh, I hope you are aware of the of the like more uh, serious background for the project that we're in a like very bad situation when it comes to climate change. And if we don't do anything very quickly, it will go very badly. Uh, so I guess what you would uh, like expect if you didn't know anything else apart from the climate change is that most, most discussions about climate change would be like, how would we mitigate climate change? And like, how would we achieve climate justice? Uh, but it's probably not the case. Uh, and what you would like to do, like in the uh, in the big picture, is, is to actually uh, investigate a lot of different kinds of corpora and see what people discussed when it comes to climate change. To to learn what I think from trying to see what people discuss, I think there is a lot of to learn how you can actually uh, find uh, solutions. To how, how to go for, forward. Uh, but for this study, which is a very small one, we performed it on one specific corpus, which is a, a corpus of uh, German tweets. And can you still hear me? Still good sound, good, good. Uh, and the reason why we wanted to do it on this particular corpus is uh, that they had uh, uh, conducted uh, annotation on, on, a, on a subset of this corpus, uh, on around 1,200 tweets, where they had, had annotated claims and evidence and sarcasm and toxic language. Um, but they had very much focused on the structure of the text, like, like is it a claim? Is it, a, is it an evidence? Is it toxic language? But they had not at all uh, looked at the actual content. What do people discuss? So they wanted some kind of some kind of examples of what people actually discuss because it's it's useful to to also say, well, this is one of the things that are actually discussed in the corpus. Uh, and what they had annotated were uh, tweets that they collected in 2019 with the criteria that it should be uh, an original uh, context tweet and then a reply to this tweet. Uh, and they, they annotated the replies, so that was what we used, uh, and they should be written in German, and they should contain the string Klima, that is climate in German. So they manually annotated around 10% of this corpus, uh, and that was that was a 10% that we wanted to see what, what does it contain. Uh, and we didn't have the time to actually look at the 1,200 tweets, which I think is a very like realistic perspective because you don't have to have time, the time to look at everything that is produced in social media. You always have to look at a small subset, when, whatever it is. So, so it's a very realistic task not to have time to look at 1,200 tweets, but perhaps around 120 tweets. So then we used a very standard uh, method. We applied topic modeling to this. Uh, and then we searched in the texts associated with the topics for finding examples of reoccurring themes. Uh, so for doing topic modeling, we use the tool that we have uh, that we are working on at SPSM. It's a tool called Topics and Themes. Uh, and it's a, it has a graphical user interface, which, which allows the user to, to interact with the output of the topic modeling. Uh, so so it, uh, the, the interface contains of three panels. So the second panel is the topics panel, which, which contains one element for each topic that is automatically detected. And then to the left, you have the terms panel, which contains the terms that are associated with the topics. Uh, so that means you can select one topic and then you the, the terms are resorted so you can see which terms are associated with the topics and you can also do it the other way around like select a term and then see which topics are associated with this term uh, and the terms are not only terms they can also be term clusters so 
before performing topic modeling, we make an automatic clustering of the text uh, to combine words that are very similar. Uh, so, like, so this is another corpus. So like we have comorbidities and comorbidity is, is uh, into one. And sociodemographic and demographic is combined into one concept and treated as one term. And then to the right, we have the texts that are associated uh, with the topics that are extracted. Um, and it's the same thing there that you can, when you select a topic, you, you get the texts that are associated with, with the topic. And, and one point of the tool is to let the user actually manually read the text and analyze the text. So it's also marked in the texts, which are the relevant terms and so on. Uh, and then we come to the fourth panel in the tool, which is uh, which is not automatically generated, but which is generated by the human. So we based the tool on a study where they had used topic modeling, but done it like with not a tool, but with the scripts. Um, and what they found there was that they also needed this like post human post processing because it's not certain that the topic modeling will find the things interesting as a human finds interesting or at the same level. Uh, so here we, we manually analyze the texts, 120 of them, and searched for, for reoccurring themes that we found in the texts. So what were the results? Um, we found 15 stable, stably occurring topics. And to answer your question then regarding the, the randomness, uh, so you don't have to post it. Uh, so we actually, <laughs> uh, we ran the algorithm, I think 500 times, and then we only uh, retained the topics that uh, that occurred in all reruns. And we, we threw away the the, la the like outliers and, and kept the, the non-outliers, and then we retained the 15 stably occurring topics. Uh, and, and for that, so the tool lets you say, like I think we said we want a maximum of 20 topics, but we were only able to, uh, retrieve 15 topics that occurred stably in all reruns. So that's the, why the number 15. So here's a zoom in of, of the topics. So it was one about Greta Thunberg, one about demonstrations, uh, one about the, like uh, criticism of, of against uh, the existence of climate change, two topics. And there were also quite a few topics that were not that very clear. Like we couldn't really find a, co a coherent topic for this for the text that were associated with the topics. Um, but then, then we read the one hundred and around one hundred and twenty tweets and and added themes in the fourth panel uh, associated with the topics. With the with the uh, we added themes when we found out something that was interesting. Uh, and in the end, we found, I think we added 50 themes or something, uh, but 14 of these occurred more than three times. So two, five of them occurred two times and 14 of them occurred three times or more. Uh, so these, that were, was, that's this, I guess, the, the final output of, of this, of the study to, to find examples of, of themes that were reoccurring. So the, these are not sorted according to, to uh, how frequent they are. It's just that they, uh, at least 14 times. Uh, so it's, some of them is about like more constructive, like criticism against the climate package not being large effective en enough. Uh, and, but then there were a lot of things like argumentation claiming that it's not proven that human activity causes climate change. And that was also something that they had noted when they had uh, annotated the more argumentation structure, and also the opposite, like people saying that it that climate change exists. And then it was criticism against Greta Thunberg, like claims that she's being forced to protest. Uh, so how is the time? Still okay. Yeah. Uh, so criticism against the field and background of, sci of scientists in relation to climate change. Uh, and criticism that climate change receives too much attention or that there is a hysteria. Uh, and criticism against the climate movement for being a sect or, or, or being too fanatic. And uh, criticism against the demonstrations 
uh, and then criticism against the political strategies in relation to climate change and criticism against activists that they are emitting a lot of, of carbon dioxide side. Uh, and then there were discussions about what is weather and what is climate. That was also something very common. Uh, and then that was a more constructive one, like trying to find reason why someone does not worry about climate change or criticism against that. Uh, and the criticism towards politicians for not doing enough for the climate and discussion about different economic instruments for climate protection. So. The, the like uh, the original question is it uh, are the are the discussions a lot about how to mitigate climate change or to how, how to how achieve climate justice it's not very much about that so that's a bit sad that is mostly other things uh, so next step uh, so we also we wanted to to run the topic model on this very small set that was manually annotated uh, to actually see what what is in that set that was manually annotated but i think the next next step is to run it on the entire set that was collected so uh, around uh, 10000 tweets and also to include because we it was if, i don't really you know if you remember but it was a context tweet and a reply tweet so we also want to try to include the context tweets and then i we we tried the topic mod this uh, this uh, it's we use non negative matrix factorization and the clustering and so far it, on all corpora we have tried it on there have been sensible topics i think this is like the most unsuccessful in terms of, of generating good topics because there were a few topics that we couldn't find any like clear topic and uh, so i think uh, i think it's good enough uh, but i think uh, but it was often the case that it wasn't really the topic modeling it was more the clustering that made us find good topics uh, so i think it, it was probably that we relied a lot, a lot on the on the word clustering rather than on the topic modeling that we found interesting things so one thing would be to try other algorithms for clustering or topic modeling that is more suitable to the very short nature of the of the tweets uh, that was all this is how you can reach me and some links. Thank you. Questions? You have to person. Okay. Thank you for a very interesting talk. Uh, the fact that you had 14 stable topics does not mean that they were the topics that were most heavily discussed in the tweets, does it? Uh, I guess it would probably be the case that uh, that they could be the ones most dis uh, because I guess that's one of the reasons why they reoccurred stably. I would guess, but it, but it, it it could do. So so I would say it's probably that uh, in a way. But I'm not. It could go. I mean, always a risk with topic modeling is that you will you will miss some topic because it is uh, the 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 way it is described varies so much, like the words that are used, and that's perhaps a larger risk when you have this short kind of texts with only yeah. the, the tweets so, so it may be that the, 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 the those that understand that we have a climate crisis have a more nuanced way of discussing it which means that they will not yeah it. yeah i think that's so that's a like a hopeful interpretation of the of the of the so thank you thank you for that one i think uh, that's true oh there's a question here as well Uh, I, I, ha I have two two questions, and, and first of all, thanks for the presentation. It's really very interesting. Um, first question is: uh, Were you able to, uh, or would you be able to, to study the uh, evolution over time of the of the kind of discussions that happen in the tweets? For, I mean, we we know that at some points people were 
discussing a lot about whether climate change really existed or not, and then at some point maybe it shifted. So, so that, that that's the first question: the the evolution over time, and whether you you have some idea about that. The second question is: um, okay, so you were expecting uh, more productive discussions about memes, etc., and you see criticism of this, criticism of that. But isn't that maybe just a findings about how Twitter works? I mean. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, so starting with the first question, that, that's a very good question. Uh, so uh, this project uh, uh, was uh, two parts. So, so this was like a, the small part of it, where we only studied tweets from 2019. But we also uh, have a larger part where we studied editorials from Nature and Science. And then we actually do the things that you talk about, that we see what, what kind. So we study editorials from Nature and Science, where they talk about climate change. And then we do a timeline where we see how the topics evolve, how they change. And the good thing there is that we also have man manually annotated data for that corpus. So we can actually compare the timeline for uh, how, uh, how what we see in topic modeling and what we see for the manual annotation. So, so yes, that is possible. And we, we are still working on that, but we, we have a paper on it that's like being written. Oh, excellent. Yeah, so thank you for the question. So they, and then I could mention that as well. The other one, yes, I think so. So, so, so you're definitely right. I mean, I, you can't say anything about like what is discussed in general. Uh, it's this particular corpus and this, and so that's also like a hopeful, a hopeful comment that it's perhaps not the the world that th this doesn't represent the world. This represents like a small space on Twitter. So thank you. Okay, any other questions? No? None? Then we'll thank the speaker again. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Can you hear me? Yeah, you are still awake. That's good. So um, I will start off by saying something about this, um, this minor study and its context. Um, it is situated in... Um, project named uh, Terrorist, Terrorism in Swedish Politics, a multimodal study of the configuration of terrorism in parliament, parliamentary debates, legislation and policy networks in, um, in Sweden, 1968 till um, 2018. So it's a large uh, digital humanities project that is funded by the Swedish Research Council and the Swedish National Bank Fund. Uh, in a joint uh, initiative, um, and um, um, the project is uh, hosted by the Royal Institute of Technology and uh, the University of Gothenburg. So I'm not, I am not alone uh, in this project. I have a bunch of co-researchers here, so I'm just the presenter here. Um, so, uh, and it's not very technical, it's more from the perspective of a user. We have been using and are, are using within this project some resources that are maintained and hosted by uh, the Swedish branch of, of Clarin. So, um, I will first uh, say something about uh, the research questions uh, guiding this, uh, this little study, make some theoretical and methodological remarks. Um, and present some, some results from this, this study. Um, so uh, the research questions here are um, first, what framing elements understood as discursive key meaning are connected to the words terrorism and terrorist? I will leave terrorist out uh, uh, for time reasons, uh, but uh, so terrorism will be in focus. So um, when used in parliamentary speeches uh, in the debate as simplexes, and as part of compounds along the lines of um, controversies and party affiliations. And um, uh, the second question will be addressed by means of a small case study dealing with the compound stats terrorism or state terrorism. So um, the data that we have analyzed um, in this study is uh, speeches or anföranden in Swedish, which is basically uh, the transcriptions of uh, oral debates in the in in the Swedish Parliament from uh, 1993 until um, 2018. So, and uh, these data are all uh, available and accessible in the Swedish National Bank uh, software system Corp, and that is also the place where we have conducted the search runs, etc. That's our 
basic um, uh, toolbox. Okay, so um, we um, have to depart from some kind of uh, notion of what terrorism is, and um, we make use of um, a definition by Jackson, which reads, terrorism is um, violence or its threat intended as a symbolically communicative act in which the direct victims uh, of the action is uh, instrumentalized as a means to creating a psychological effect of intimidation and fear in a target audience for a political objective. Uh, so this means basically that terrorism isn't just um, violence uh, or, or, uh, or um, 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 violent acts, um, but it is violence in a political context um, and uh, with a symbolic value. Um, we depart from a definition of discourse as a cluster or context-dependent semiotic practices that are situated within specific fields of social action. So that means here uh, the field is the parliament and um, these semiotic practices are, of course, uh, the speeches that we analyze and they all relate to the, ma the macro topic of terrorism in one way or the other. Um, framing is a part of the title of this uh, study. And um, as you probably know, this is a, a yeah, pretty much contested con a concept in, in different uh, disciplines, emanates from uh, AI, the 1970s, and it has been developed uh, further in uh, media studies, communication studies, and linguistics. One good definition, I think, is the one from Entman, uh, uh, which reads, framing essentially involves selection and salience. To frame is to select some aspects of a perceived reality and make them more salient in a communicating text in such a way as to promote a particular problem definition, causal interpretation, moral evaluation, and or treatment recommendation for the item described. So this uh, basically means, I think, that uh, a frame can be understood as a structure for knowledge. So um, a frame is something something that is evoked when using certain word, words. And um, as um, uh, theorists such as uh, Busse and Wheeling underline, there is no really, um, no linguistic act um, uh, which is not embedded in some kind of frame or Deutungsrahmen uh, uh, in German. So, and that leads me to the question, what is, what could be a basic frame for terrorism? Um, we need some kind of event, act of terrorism, something that happens. Uh, we need some kind of agent, someone has to perpetrate an act of terrorism. We need some kind of target, we need um, a place, terrorism has to be situated spatially in some way. And we need some kind of motive or a symbolic uh, meaning of terrorism, otherwise it isn't really terrorism. Um, so, and that's um, sort of the, um, uh, the points of departure. So, and we have, uh, as I said before, um, used CORP, um, the software CORP, uh, where we have access to these uh, speeches um, and we have then applied word pictures and co-occurrences. So basically looking for um, in, in what kind of contexts or embeddings uh, does uh, the word terrorism occur? So turning to some results now, you can see here, this is um, the, um, uh, a graph from, from CORP, which displays how uh, terrorism, um, uh, terrorism uh, occurs from um, 1993 until 2018. And um, yeah, there are some interesting things here. First, the simplexes are uh, very much more common than, uh, than the compounds. Um, out of 4,755 five, five, uh, uh, instances generated by this search string terrorism uh, with asterisks, um, the vast majority are simplexes, and then we have like 356 uh, compounds, instances of, of compounds. So, and what is interesting in this graph, of course, is the fact that um, uh, terrorist, terrorism seems to be almost absent in parliamentary speeches until 2001. 
at least uh, in the form of the linguistic form terrorism. It might have been discussed in other terms, but terrorism is, um, it's, is, is pretty absent until 2001. And the explanation for this, um, or the explanation for the sudden rise in 2001 is of course um, uh, the attack on World Trade Center in New York. Um, and second, there is a period uh, between 2012 and 2015 uh, which is um, uh, with the relatively few hits, and then it rises again, and that is probably uh, due to the increased focus on the Islamic State, etc. So I have like five minutes left. Yes, yes, I think I have to rush through uh, my slides here. Uh, this is um, a graph also from um, um, from um, from uh, Corp, and it uh, basically displays the co-occurrences, uh, the best friends of terrorism, and we can take notice of uh, in this yellow bar here that uh, the strongest uh, um, uh, co-occurrence word is um, um, among the propositions is moot, which means against. So we can conclude that uh, discursive key meaning here. Um, um, relating to terrorism is that terrorism is something that um, um, politicians strive to overcome or tackle or uh, do something against in one way or uh, another. A um, um, few examples here, I think I skipped them. Um, here are um, the, the compounds of ter with terrorism and we have this sudden rise here in 2001 again and then it rises dramatically in 2015. Um, and this is probably also due to the increased focus on the Islamic State and Daesh and um, well, the development where we had terrorist attack attacks also on European ground. So that sort of uh, increases um, the attention to this, uh, to this topic. Um, among the uh, compounds, we have um, 10, um, that occur um, more than 10 times. Um, and these are displayed here. Uh, we have both um, compounds that are more descriptive and we have also compounds that are more ideologically imbricated. And one such, um, um, one such example of an ideo ide ideo ideologically imbricated, imbricated word is of course, uh, stats terrorism or state terrorism, which is in the context in the context of terrorism nowadays a somewhat curious um, finding, a curious word, you could say, because uh, state terrorism isn't really the typical form of terrorism. Nowadays, we 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 often mean um, acts um, committed by clandestine groups opposing a state, but state terrorism refers to states that. Um, uh, well, uh, allegedly uh, commit uh, terrorist acts. So, and um, as I said before, we took a look at um, party affiliations and uh, what we can say here is, um, um, well, before that, that um, the alleged agents behind state terrorism are the following. So Israel ranks highest here with 16 hits, Iran, Turkey, Russia, and there is an interesting um, bias here um, on the political spectrum uh, in so far as um, this, the term state terrorism is most often used by parties uh, on the left side. So the left party, the Green Party and the Social Democrats. Um, and whereas center liberal conservative parties um, uh, use this word uh, more seldom. Um, and we can see uh, the distribution here the party that um, uses state terrorism most often is the Green Party. Then we have the left party, the Social Democratic Party. Um, and uh, yeah, well, then um, the center liberal conservative parties who uh, don't really use this too often. One interesting example here from a Social Democratic member of parliament, Lena Jan Balen, um, is the following. Uh, in interestingly, quoting a court decision in Germany. After state terrorism on the part of Iran has been concluded by a court in Germany, we must now review the forms of our contacts, contacts with Iran in general. So I come to some final remarks, pre preliminary, but still 
Uh, the agent slot is often occupied by Islamist and or international agents that could be seen in this graph displaying uh, the co-occurrences with terrorism. So terrorism is uh, often depicted as an international, a foreign phenomenon, you could say. Uh, to some extent, we have agents, uh, agents that are identified with states, state actors, uh, which we could see in this um, little um, case study on uh, state terrorism. The motive slot is often empty. Um, the politicians don't reveal very much about that, uh, but the symbolic meaning of terrorist acts or terrorism in general is often implied uh, if we uh, are able to identify uh, the agents. Um, and the reason for this slot being um, empty is probably that uh, the discourse in the parliament is very general and it doesn't say very much about specific terrorist acts. Target slot, often empty. The play slot, the, the spatial slot, so to say, is um, in many cases underspecified, but uh, sometimes possible to locate outside of Sweden. But um, from 2015 and onwards, probably uh, more frequently framed also as a Swedish phenomenon, something that happens or might, might happen in Sweden, but that has to be examined. So thank you very much. Uh, questions? Thank you very much. This is very interesting. Uh, so I, I've only used Coop very little so far, but I think my plan is to use it much more in the future. So were you able to do everything that you wanted in Corp, or was it something that you like needed to do outside of the tool? Uh, we have hitherto just uh, only analyzed uh, this material inside of CORP, but um, uh, I mean, we have in this project also um, some technologists on board, and um, I think they will try to develop um, other tools and methods. Um, but I think for this um, minor case study, we could use, uh, I think we we got the help we, we needed, so to speak, from, from the CORP toolbox. Um, as far as I know now, yeah. Okay, thank you. I also add that Leif Jöran also, which is part of one of the co-authors of, sort of the research, research engineers and National Language Bank of Sweden, is also online. I, uh, so I don't know if it's active much, but I think he is a nice face there. <laughs> uh, I think questions go back directly to him. But you have inspired me to start using Corp more, so thank you. Uh, any further questions? I have a potentially <laughs> um, problematic uh, remark or question, but um, with the words uh, like terrorism, um, we probably all know that they are often misused by politicians. So the attestations in the corpus maybe don't necessarily refer to terrorism as such, but maybe as uh, misuse for political agendas. Have you looked into that uh, aspect of problematic words like this? So, for example, this is a, this is terrorism. Some politic, political party would claim to attack some other political players, but it's not actually terrorism. They just use the word terrorism for a concept that is not terrorism. Well, you can say that's part of what the project is all about, in a way, to see how politicians use terrorism, whether it's actual or not. I mean, what we, as researchers, using this definition would say is an actual act of terrorism. That's part of the interest to see actually what they, I mean, describe as such. And as we see, I mean, from the political debate in Sweden, not just in Sweden, but internationally, terrorism is used in many different ways. And also in a way it's expanding its meaning. We have politicians in Sweden that talk about the gang violence should be treated as or described as terrorism. Uh, and maybe it's not really seen as uh, fair to do that today, but maybe in five, ten years' time it will be, because that's also part of what we're investigating, sort of what how the meaning of terrorism is changing over time. Uh, 
And what we see, and we've also done earlier studies, we also see that terror is very much connected to left-wing violence, you can say, sort of in the interwar period, but also in right-wing violence there. And then sort of this modern meaning is coming from 1970s onwards. So we basically are also following sort of the uh, diachronicity of the, the term. Yeah, maybe I, I could just add it's um, what also is part of the project is to to touch on uh, the conceptual changes of terrorism and how other words have been display uh, de deployed in order to say something about what we nowadays call terrorism. Like pre 1970 uh, in Swedish debate, uh, people talked about terror. And then terrorism was established or, or came in, in, in use. And nowadays we have uh, um, words um, like uh, extremism, uh, etc., violent extremism that are, uh, well, not synonymous with terrorism, but is uh, are very close. So that's also part of this project to, to look into these uh, this competing, uh, competing concepts that um, sort of, uh, um, yeah, uh, describe uh, or say something about political violence. Um, I think that is the final remark of today's session. Uh...